Hello everybody and good evening. I've never heard that sort of classical piano rendition of Waterfall by the Stone Roses. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, my name is uh, Liz Mosey and I'm an editor here at Tortoise. This is my last thinking before the summer break, so um, let's make it a good one. Um, we're here to answer um, this question, should any woman be put in prison? It's not a specific woman we're talking about. It's a general woman. And um, we are joined by some, um, a really extraordinary group of people who have between them um, some very particular experience that can help us try and answer this question. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, and I know there are some first timers, it's a thinking. So the idea is we will hear from our invited guests, but we also want to hear from you. Um, so do please join in. If you're watching from home, please join in in the chat where Phoebe is there to sort of capture, ask questions um, and what have you. And I may well bring people in on screen as we go along. Um, I'm going to start with a show of hands at the beginning in answer to this specific thinking question. I don't always do this, but I think it's a clear enough question, albeit a difficult answer maybe. So please put your hand up in the room if you think that, now how do I ask the question in a way that's easy? Um, if you think that we should close all the women's prisons, raise your hand right the way up, all the way. Okay, excellent, which means that the other half think, no. Louise Simpson, I can see in the chat, thinks no. You on the back row there, you tentatively put your hands up. Can I, um, Seb, can we get a mic to um, these people on the back row? And I want to hear why. You see, you've lurked at the back thinking you'd be safe from this, I'm afraid, <laughs> straight in. What's your name? Uh, my name's Sophie. Hi, Sophie. So you would it, abolish the prisons. I'm going to make you Justice Minister tomorrow, and that's it, step one. T tell us some of the reasons why you put your hand up to that um, question. I think because just in general, the criminal justice system seems to like be quite heavily flawed and a really ineffective way of processing prisoners and like justice seems to be like very hard to attain uh, because of like the financial situation stuff like that and that prison is a really ineffective form of punishment mm -hmm. and like more um, preventative measures or investing large amounts that we put into prisons and instead into preventative measures would be a much better or like restorative measures would be a much better solution. So you close all the prisons not just the women's ones? Yeah. Okay. Exciting. Okay, thank you very much, Sophie. Lovely to hear from you. Um, who else put their hand up for that question so that they would abolish women's prison? Somebody over here, like you're regretting it now. Let's get a <laughs> mic to this person here. What's your name? Uh, my name is Lisha. Hi, Lisha. Uh, I, yeah, I agree with what Sophie was saying, basically. Um, prisons are ineffective and there are better ways of dealing with uh, criminals. What do you think <laughs> prisons are for, Lisha? I think they're for safety, for our safety, the public safety, and like as a um, means to exert control over these people who seem to not fit into society's norms. But um, there's other ways of rehabilitation and recovery from those sort of instances. So, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, and well, well done for being <laughs> bravely um, landed on at the very beginning. I can already see some people asking in the chat, I bet you can guess what the question has been asked in, um, this is Angela Cohen sitting next to me here, who's written this extremely brilliant book. Um, Angela's spent most of your career in social care working in prisons. Mm -hmm. um, and the questions that people are saying when we hear from Sophie and from Leisha, yes, there are better ways to help people. The prison system is flawed. It costs loads of money. It doesn't really work. Um, people are saying, but what, are, what do we do with the murderers? Yeah. Go for it. So I specifically <laughs> wrote a chapter in this book called But What About the Pedos? to answer that question. And what we're doing now doesn't work. What we're doing now, our sex offender treatment programmes in males, male prisons specifically actually increase the risk of um, reoffending. So doing nothing and leaving just someone on a wing in prison rather than trying to put them through a rehabilitation program in prison would be better for us the general public so i also agree i don't think the prison estate works i think if it 
would work, it would have worked by now. We've had these old Victorians for over 180 years and they are failed and flawed. And we need to really rethink our approach to the criminal justice system. And that doesn't mean that we should just open the doors now and kind of let the murderers out and let the, the paedophiles go. But we need to really rethink what we want our prisons to be. And by calling them prisons and by trying to reform this broken system, I don't think we will ever succeed. So that whilst I agree that some dangerous people need to, for a time, be taken out of society into a secure environment and either be rehabilitated or for the very, very tiny minority who maybe that isn't possible for, we need to keep them in a secure environment where the staff are supported as well to manage those people as best as possible. But at the moment we have 80,000 prisoners at the moment and only 65 of those people will never be released. The rest are coming out back into our communities at some point. So for every one prisoner who's never coming out, there are 10,000 yeah. more who are in and out and in and out. Yeah. As much as you are. Interesting. Yeah. Right, we're going to come back and properly unpack some of these points um, that Angela is making. One of the people who's joined us on the line, I think she's probably in Texas actually, is um, Kerry Blakinger, who's written this book, which I don't think is out yet, Kerry. Is it out yet? Let's see if we can hear Kerry. Uh, yeah, it's out. Yes. Oh, good. I I've got an uncorrected copy, which I've folded down okay. lots of the, the corners. Um, I want to speak to Kerry and I want to speak to Brenda here in, in the studio with us about what it's like to be in prison. Um, this book is Kerry's um, story and it honestly took my breath away. It's incredibly moving um, and quite difficult in places, also quite funny in places too, I hope, I hope it's okay to say. Um, and Kerry is now a, a, a journalist who does reporting specifically on prisons, not just women's prisons, all, all prisons, people in prison and, and so on, and how the system should or shouldn't change. Kerry, one of the things that you um, say in the book um, is what, 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 what the, the feeling that you really land is what it feels like to be in, in prison. And perhaps that's different from what those of us who have not been in prison imagine it would feel like to be in prison, what happens to you. Would you just sort of give us a sense of, of that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's a number of angles here, but I think actually some of the women specific angles um, I didn't quite dive into as much in the book as I might have. Um, one of the sort of overriding things that I think about a lot, especially in light of what's been going on in terms of American women's bodily autonomy right now, is just the ways in which prisons weaponize um, women's bodies to take away their dignity. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of people, at least in America, that don't really care about dignity for prisoners, just sort of view it as unimportant. But, you know, for example, when, um, you know, when I was in jail at one point, um, you know, I had, I, I, I'd started having my period and I had it for like six months straight and they didn't, you know, they didn't put me on any sort of birth control or medication for that. Um, and that is not just inconvenient and awful, but it's actually, uh, you know, it, it, it actually ends up being a major source of shame when you're in that sort of carceral environment because of the way the cell blocks were set up. And it was, we'd be in individual cells with bars, but there was long windows along the, the side of the cell block. So everybody walking by could see. So every time that you'd be changing a tampon, your ex could walk by, your ex's best friend, like whatever random other inmate was there, you know, GED teacher, sergeant, whatever. Um, and every time you'd go through a strip search, you'd have to pull out your tampon in front of the guard. And, you know, these are things that, um, go from being sort of inconvenient disregard for women's medical care to, you know, putting them in an environment that is made largely for men and structured in such a way that it also undermines your dignity in a way that I think, um, I think the toll of it only becomes apparent like over time. And going back to what someone else had said about public safety, I think that one of the problems with doing this with, you know, taking away people's sort of basic sense of um, 
dignity and worth can undermine any can undermine the possible public safety uh, benefits of prisons if you end up teaching the lesson that people don't have value and then you release them believing that they have even less value than when they came in um so i don't know sort of rambling there but that's a sort of women specific look at what uh some of the ways our prisons fail thank you kerry i would love to know to leisha's point about what prison is for that prisons are there to keep everybody safe and i want to come to brenda whose work very much focuses on life afterwards um, in a second. Um, do you think that it is possible to design an incarceration system, a prison system for women? Like you say, if we think about the experience you had and you say in the book, you know, it, it, the system wasn't designed with women in mind. Um, could, could it be the case that we would say, OK, well, we're going to keep the concept of prison, but we're going to design it in a female friendly way? Is that a thing or is that just a total anathema? I think that prison in a human friendly way, female or otherwise, would look so different from what it currently does. It is probably not something we would recognize as prison. OK, good, good answer. We'll, we'll pick away at that in a second, Kerry. Thank you. Um, Brenda, hello. Brenda, a.k.a. Lady Unchained. Hello. Your work, you're a, you're a poet and a performer and, all, and an activist and all kinds of things. Um, but you um, specifically work with people and talk about how to build a life after you've been in prison. Because another line from uh, Kerry's book that really stuck with me was, parole isn't really designed for you to succeed at yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I, th I believe that probation in this country is a sim similar kind yeah. of vibe. There's lots of things you can't do mm -hmm. and that are denied to you as a normal citizen human being in the world once you've been in prison. Yeah, yeah I think it's very hard like, to rebuild after prison, I think. When you're in jail, even if you have like some kind of like passion to say, when I get out, I'm gonna do this. When you get out, the, 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 you're faced with this reality of like, actually, I'm now a con like I'm a convicted felon. Like I'm an inmate. Like I'm always gonna be an inmate. And when you're in jail, they always remind you that you are gonna come back. You always come back here. Everyone that comes to jail comes back, really? and they tell you that. You know, you have to think if you have a child and you keep telling the child you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, the child is going to grow up. Why do they to, tell you that you're going to come back? Because for them, they're only seeing the people coming in and out the door. They're not seeing anything outside. So for an oh. officer to see a woman come back to jail constantly, which also for me being in prison, I, I was very, I was very shocked. Like I, I didn't want to be in prison, and yeah. I, I really kind of like was hoping that they had made some kind of massive mistake. So to see women come in and out of prison. I was quite angry at these women, you know, mm. I was like, why do you want to come back here? But the reality of it is that when you come out, you know, now you have this new conviction. I never had a conviction before I'd gone to college. I had like national diplomas and, you know, I kind of had my life planned in a way to, to have a career. Um, but now I'm having to declare this conviction. Um, I'm having to talk about the fact that I can't actually go to this a certain area because my license condition is, um, prevents me from, um, yeah. prevents me from like, um, actually go into these places but the, I think the hardest thing is actually going up for jobs and then really <laughs> seeing that the only reason you haven't got this job is because of your conviction whereas before I can turn jobs down you know yeah. and then the hardest another thing is like it's so easy to go back onto probation but then when you're on probation that's when you realize oh I could have been offered this last year when I was on probation oh I could have been off offered housing support and uh, mm -hmm. help with like benefits before this but instead I had to find my own way and if you don't if you're if you're not allowed to go to a certain area and you're not allowed to you're still afraid of how people see you you're not going to do anything you're just going to sit at home and more than likely end up in exactly the same situation you was in in the beginning or a worse one mm -hmm. so w tell us a bit about the work you do now so my work, I created Unchained Poetry, which is an artistic platform for artists with lived experience of the criminal justice system. And I kind of set that up because I had seen, for me, my experience of never being in jail and then coming out and seeing the news kind of like really repeating the stats of me possibly going back to prison. And I kind of got to this point where I was like, is there nobody that doesn't want to go back to jail? You know, because media is telling me, 
you must want to go back to jail. Like, it's a fun place, right? You still have three meals a day. You go to the gym. <laughs> like, oh, isn't it fun there? You know, yeah. and part of me, I'm, I'm like, you know, even if you think about someone that's got depression, you know, you find days to smile. It's, you're not constantly, like, with a sad face. Like, you know, depression is the hardest thing to, like, even tell that someone's got it because we can really put on the face and pretend everything's OK. Mm -hmm. um, so when I set up my thing, it was the fact that I wanted people to tell their stories. I wanted people to prove that we can rebuild, whether it's through creativity, whether it's poetry, whether it's film, whether it's dance. I want you to just tell your story. Tell your story to somebody that has never met anybody like you. Tell your story in a way that, you know, because when I was in jail, I saw people and I really didn't... I think there's people that I met, friends that I have now, that I would have never met if I didn't go to jail. And I remember thinking when I first got to prison, oh my God, everybody must be really evil here. I'm gonna die here, they're gonna kill me in this place, there must be real criminals. Because I didn't see myself as a real criminal, so I saw them as the problem. So I was very afraid of them. And then I slowly started to talk to people and realise, oh, you're actually here because you're a partner? You just love the wrong guy and you're in jail? and he's outside, like, you know, so I had to make sure that other people that might never, you know, go to prison and hear these stories get to hear them because I never heard them. I never heard them before prison. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be able to do that. So now I, I go out and I talk about it, but I also host National Prison Radio's Free Flow, where I have people in prison and I kind of like, I give them advice, but it's all about writing. So they get to call in, spit some bars down the phone line. I tell them it's cool, <laughs> sick, that's good. You know, and, but also I'm trying to explain to them that I've never done my writing or creativity just because I want to be famous or known. I'm doing it because if you can stand on a stage and tell your story to random people that don't know you and then come out and shake their hand and talk to them, you can go out and go to a job interview. You can go out and go anywhere else and you have that confidence. Um, all I'm doing is giving them a stage and they're not realising that it's a stage that is helping them really build that confidence, that, that, that doubt that they had in themselves, that they couldn't do anything. Now you're amongst people that more than likely, some of them might even be probation, they might even be prison officers, and now you're shaking hands with somebody that you once thought, I hate you guys, mm. do you know? Yeah. It's breaking that barrier, so that's kind of what I do, just to make sure that people um, get to hear these stories, but also just to just change the narrative. I, all, I came out of jail and I thought, I'm always going to go back to jail because that's what I believe, that's what I was told, that's what was installed in my head. And then I had to go, actually, no, I'm not going back to jail. I, I didn't like it. So I have to do something about it. And that's what I've done. Um, thanks, Brenda. I'm going to come to Amanda in the telly um, in a minute. If you've got any thoughts or questions or anything you want to add, just stick your hand up. We'll get a mic to you. Um, we said at the top, um, and I think there was some data on the screens, there's sort of there or thereabouts just over 3,000 women at the moment in prison in this country. Numbers go up and down a little bit, but I think the trend is down at the moment. Um, and there was a report came out today, quite by coincidence, actually. It's almost like we planned it, but um, the uh, Justice Committee has published a report on women in prison, basically saying um, there was a 2018 female offender strategy came out from the MOJ um, a few years ago, strategic priorities, fewer women come into the criminal justice system, fewer women in custody, especially on short sentences, and a greater proportion of women managed in the community successfully with better conditions for those in custody. So all good, that sounds like it's broadly moving in the right direction, but the report today basically said, we haven't got anywhere. Mm -hmm. we've, not, we've not got anywhere against any of those things. What, what's your best guess as to why that is? Is it more important things elsewhere? Is it this is only 3,000 people, doesn't really matter? Is it just a political hot potato, don't go there? What, what's your best read on that, would you say, Angela? Um, oh, this is where I get a bit ranty. I ranty. think we have completely slashed and burnt community services. So when I'm saying don't put people into prison, put them into rehab instead, or yeah. give someone a community order because community orders work yeah. better than a prison sentence, Do we, we don't that? have we them. In. That. Yeah, so for anything less than 12 months, a community order is more successful at reducing reoffending than a custodial sentence. And does it cost more money? Is that why they're no, not used? No, it's cheaper because... What's the reason? I think the government has... Um, these guidelines that the, the magistrate was talking about, the government yeah. has progressively increased the guidelines, so judges have to give longer sentences. Right. They have to give custodial sentences. A very cynical me would say, because we're privatising our prison estate at a rate of knots that's embarrassing. Um, there are 20,000 new prison spaces that are going to be open in the next three years, which are all private prison spaces run by big companies. Didn't we have a thinking, I'm just trying to remember looking at Giles, didn't we have a thinking not long ago where a guy came on and said that the government had an unofficial target yeah. 
for the number of prisoners it wanted to have, which was 100,000. Was that, am I remembering that right, or have I got that well, wrong? We will be at 100,000 by 2026. There's 20,000. Okay, maybe it's not a target, that would yeah. be a weird thing to say, but it's like, that's the expected volume of people. Yeah, and, and that's, so that's an extra 20,000 prisoners that we will find from somewhere who currently aren't in prison. So they're not, they're not in prison yet, but we will make longer sentences. We will make custodial sentences to fill those prison spaces. Huh. Because it's counterintuitive to a private business model to that can't be, I, I can't. I can't get there. The, the, re, the, the reason why we want more prisons is because we, don't, we make money. I, ca I can't. Honestly, like, it is, it's, the, it is, it has, it's, it's the only explanation because I, I found out about women's centres like after jail, like at least then, 10 years after. And I was, oh, they were like, oh, do you want to do, go into the women's centres and meet these ladies? And I said, what's the, what's the women's centre? A women's centre is an alternative to prison. So if a woman yeah. goes up against a magistrate or a tribunal, whatever, they, the judge can actually say, well, instead of sending you to prison, you have to do an order and you have to go into this community centre, um, this women's centre. There's no men, it's just women. Um, most of them have like creches, they have like, you know, therapy. I, I go in and I do um, poetry workshops. We sit down, I've had like 10 women and we've sat down and we spoke and just got together and just spoke about things that they will never speak about outside of that space. Do you understand? But these are alternatives that exist. They, they're around, you know, there's, they're in South London, they're in East, they're in um, every area. I've, I've done a tour, I was in like Manchester. We went everywhere. There is women's centres everywhere. So there's not enough of them because obviously they don't want to invest in them. Mm -hmm. But had they, if there was more of those, there would be another way that these women, when we're talking about them losing their house, losing their children, then they come out, catch 22. You've got no house, so you can't get your children back. You've got no address, so you can't get, get any medical. It's just you have now made this person go into another longer process, and that is why women do stand in front of a judge and say, yes, send me back to prison, mm -hmm. because it is easier for me to get everything I need in jail. I've got a community of people. I've got three meals a day. I don't have to beg for it. Look, if there's a GP, I've got to go and ask for medical. It's fine. We're making people believe that it is safer and more important, like more serious and like comfortable to be in prison because mm. we're not giving them the alternatives that are clearly available. Yeah. And that's not to say prison is comfortable, it's just these women's lives in the community are so chaos bad. And so difficult. Exactly. Yeah. Um, thanks so much um, to everybody in Charlotte as well. Let's bring in Amanda now, if we can, patiently waiting at home up in Sunny Hull. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Hiya. Um, thanks very much for, for being with us. Now, Amanda Hales is a campaigner and co-founder of um, something called Untold Story Hull. Just give us a two-sentence version of what that is and what you do, Amanda. Um, it raises lived experience to uh, make policy and practice change uh, within broken systems because we recognise the systems are broken. So we, um, it's multiple disadvantage, so childhood trauma, domestic abuse, um, addiction, um, and also um, mental health, mental ill health. And I have lived experience of, of a vast amount of multiple disadvantage and that started off as childhood trauma. And we need to recognize that um, adverse childhood experiences and children who um, are going through these experiences often become adults with multiple disadvantage and Often, because the mental health service is so broken, you can't access mental health treatment, so you self-medicate with drugs and alcohol and prescription medication, and then you're having to c commit crime to keep that addiction going. And it's usually petty crime, you know, um, shoplifting, petty drug dealing, um, street-based sex work, sex work, and, you're committing crime also to put a roof over your head. So, and, and to put food on the table or just to pay for that sofa that you're surfing on. And women are risking their lives, you know, having to, ha having to choose between a life of crime or a life of unresolved trauma. So, you know, I found that when I went to prison, I was uh, two really short sentences in the same summer. I went into a detox wing and it's not just a few beds that, you know, we are talking of a, a, a whole wing of women who are de trying to detox of drugs and alcohol. And it, it's like most of them 
of those women are, have committed petty crimes. And surely, you know, we shouldn't be in prison because we're a nuisance. And it costs so much money to imprison a woman for a week. And so why isn't that money used at the very start when the woman needs proper help and support with her mental health and her addiction and housing and domestic abuse? There's so many disadvantages, you know, that are faced by women in prison. And then you end up in, in the cycle of addiction, of homelessness and, and prison. And it, it becomes that so overwhelming. So you're pushing down all that trauma as well. And then it's more drugs, more alcohol. When in fact, we, we just need better mental health treatment in this country. Again, it is a failed system. And we are trying to so solve modern day problems with Victorian thinking. And it's so outdated that we, it needs a whole system overhaul, not just the prison system, criminal justice system, but housing. You know, we've got, it's 2022. Why are people still homeless on the streets? You know, why are they having to face committing crime for putting a roof over their head? And can I just ask a quick question? Sorry, um, you're yeah. in full flow. It's all, it's all good. Um, can I just ask a quick question, which is, um, there's a there's a line I think it's in Angela's book actually, which really um, hit home. I watched a um, movie at the weekend called Legend about the craze. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Yeah. And there's a line in Angela's book that says, "We love a certain kind of gangster." You're trying to talk. Yeah. Your book is actually mainly about men in prison. Actually, um, there's a sort of and the, the implication being there's a, there's a kind of a good kind of criminal and then a bad kind, and I. I wonder, with what you're describing and the, the kinds of experiences you're talking about, Amanda, they, they echoed in, in Kerry's story, they are echoed in all the men's stories in your book too, mental ill health, really awful trauma and social, just all sorts of, it's all, you know, all the fun of the fair in that regard, really consistently across everybody's experiences. Yeah. But I wonder if, for women who are in prison in particular, there isn't a good kind of gangster figure. No. I think women who end up in prison, I, it, maybe this is me and, and disagree with me, I, I feel like all women prisoners seem like the, they, they just des must deserve it. There's yeah. something yeah. Uh, gendered about it. Am I, am I imagining yeah. that? Me Brenda's checking I'm my... Yeah. No. Because obviously women are seen, again, what, what Amanda's saying about we're treating them like, you know, the old, we're thinking with the old Victorian ways. So women should be in the kitchen, they should be having children, they shouldn't be committing crimes. You can't, what, what are you doing? You're a woman. Do you understand? So yeah. for guys, it's like, well, you know, he's a top gangster, he had to do what he did for the family, and there's, there's an explanation for it. Whereas with women, we're looked at a little bit different because if you commit a crime, then what the hell is wrong with you? Yeah. 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 Um, OK, let's, let's try a, a couple of other different kinds of questions. Um, one question, um, anybody please do to join, and, and, and Kerry too, I know, is, is listening. Um, is it fair and or feasible to have sex-differentiated sentencing? Is that possible, that if a man does a thing, there could be a custodial sentence, but in the world, Sophie's world, where we've shot all the women's prisons, a woman has done a thing and that's not a custodial Is that conceivably possible or are we going to have to abolish all prisons? Hand up there. Um, Can we get you a mic, sir? Sorry. Right. What's your name? Uh, I'm, I'm Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. Sir, hello. Well, I think we're already doing that. If we look at America, a man can't have an abortion, so a man can't be sent to prison for an abortion. So we're already that's arguably a different crime, but I take, I take your point. Yeah. It, would that be... Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah. Is, it, is it... Most women go to prison for non-violent crimes. I think that we know that. There are lots of men also in prison for non-violent crimes. Is that a non-starter? Is it just a weird thing to say? I personally just think the whole system is a mess. I think that every person should be looked at individually, yeah. not as, oh, gosh, he just reminded me of the other guy, or actually he's back again. No one's going to look into the, the simple reason of why is this guy back again in front of the judge. I think it needs to be looked at. Yeah, we, we're saying, we're talking about women right now in, in that regards because 
if you think about the woman, the woman's the one that stays at home with the children. If a man's taken out of the home, the woman stays with the kid. When we start to remove the, the, the mother from the kid, you're now also sentencing the children to another sentence. So yeah. I think as a whole, because then that's a whole other thing that we're going into child, like the, the care system and the amount of children from the care system that are now in prison. That's a whole other system. So I think we have to look at people as a whole when we're like sentencing them, look at everything that we're thinking about the women, if they've been abused. So, there's so many things that happen to women and guys that never ever gets heard in yeah. a courtroom. Do you understand? And I think that this is, if we're talking about, you know, for me, for example, my probation officer basically said, don't send this girl to jail. She's got a lot going on. I'm surprised she didn't commit a crime when she was younger. Please do not send her to jail. So that clearly had no hold because yeah. I went to prison and I yeah. got two and a half years. So I think everything needs to be looked at as an individual, not just, oh, another woman has committed a crime, God, just send her down, I'll oh, just send her down. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we're just convicting people because we think, you know, we've got this joint enterprise where we're just convicting about 10 people for 25 years. Not one of them can, you can't prove that one of them is actually the one that actually killed the person, but you're going to send 10 young people and you're going to give them 25 years each at 17 years old. Yeah. And that, and then they're in the justice system. They can't even do any work until they get to, I think it's the last three years of their sentence. Yeah. So you sentence them to 25 years because they're a problem. You don't even know if they commit the crime because joint enterprise is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> but you're going to leave them in jail for 25 years. And when they're back, got three years left, you're going to go, oh, right, actually, you might need to do some courses, mate. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, there's some really um, good work, actually, that my colleague um, uh, Dave Taylor did with John Crilly and all about joint, uh, joint enterprise, which maybe Phoebe can dig it out and, and, and stick it in the chat. I'd love to come just so the chaps at the back know um, in a second to Rona Epstein, who's watching from home and has done loads of work on short sentencing and pregnant women in prison and things like that. But I can see Giles has got the mic. Giles, what do you want to say? Uh, very quickly, um, everything you describe, Brenda, is obviously awful and probably applies to... Um, uh, uh, accused people of both genders, but I, I have to say that the answer to your question has to be no, right? Uh, that we can't do sex differentiated sentences. Yeah, I'm no yeah. lawyer, but if you take the same crime yeah. and two people of different genders and one goes to prison because of his gender and the other doesn't because of hers, and you appeal that to any Supreme, Supreme Court, yeah. they'd say, well, if we're going to stick with and uh, um, a law against gender discrimination, we have you can't to, do we, it. Yeah, have to say you can't do that. Which means the next important question to, for this conversation is how does one build a political consensus around the types of reforms that you're all talking about, which is not just about make the prisons nicer, you know, let staff up and train everybody properly, and all of the things that you set out in your book, Angela, but also fix all the other stuff too, all the bit that comes before, which is an, surely an impossible task. I, I and then we end up back at the beginning again. Do you know what I mean? Like... I think we've had this real political chipping away that anything that befalls you in life, any bad luck or misfortune or bad choices, is the fault of the individual. Um, this real kind of chipping away of, of community and society and whatever happens in your life is the individual's fault rather than some of the things that may have happened to you. Um, and the, the one line in my book that I'm like, I always, I always re I'm really strong about is like, when did it become the poor against the poverty stricken? We have this real like divisive politics now that tells us it's your fault if you go to prison, it's your fault if you do something wrong. And I think the thing that I've come up with is this method of having real purposeful conversations around this subject. And this goes for like everyone who's even remotely interested. Because if you're interested in any form of social justice in the community, like the prison system is systemically racist. We know that we have the data. Yeah. So if you care about that in the community, remember there's people in prison who are, who are suffering from that. Mm -hmm. If you care about mental health in the community and you support charities like MIND, it's worse in prison. Remember people in prison tonight have got those problems as well. Yeah. And I think when you explain it in those terms that like we all care about some social justice issue, it's worse in prison, um, people start to recognise that, yeah. I think. Thanks ever so much. Sorry. Let's go to Rona Epstein, if we can. I can see Sophie's got her hand in the air as well, and I want to come back to Kerry. Hi, Rona. Let's see if we can hear Rona. Hello. Hi. Oh, we could hear you, and now we can't again. Hang on. 
try can again. You, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Uh, yeah, hello, did you have a question for me? Well, I just um, I just say you've done research. There's another person that, who's watching tonight, like Jenny Earl, who said you've done research on short yes. sentencing and yes. pregnant women in prison. Just tell us how you come at the, these kinds of issues. Uh, right, yes, so I've done, I've done some research with uh, Lucy Baldwin. You, you may know the, um, the name. Um, she's done a lot of research on women in prison. And we looked at women who serve short sentences um, and found that in spite of the sentences being very short, the damage is very great when they leave children behind. We found children who had been put in charge of younger children and had therefore be, had to leave school. And we found children who were very disturbed and clingy and difficult to manage on the mother's return, even after a very short sentence. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a big job to be done. It was interesting to hear from the magistrates speaking. I think there's a big job to be done in the education of magistrates in how different it is to sentence a mother uh, from to sentencing a man who may or may not be a dad and may or may not be close to his children because the mother's usually taking the primary role and leaves much more damage behind. And I think the magistrates need to be much more aware of this than they are. So that's one point. Yeah. Um, I recommend everybody to look at the blog of Shona Minson, M-I-N-S-O-N. -S uh, she's an Oxford academic who's written a great deal about this point. And she's actually produced training materials to train judges in how they should consider the child. And she's also got on her website, on her blog, um, a very interesting film, which is for defendants. So those are the people watching who actually work with women who, and, and also to the magistrate, Charlotte, who work with women who come before the courts should have a look. Shall I just repeat the name? Shona, S-H-O-N-A, Minson, M-I-N-S-O-N. Look at her blog. She's at Oxford University and look at her materials for judges. And you can't see the one for judges, but you can see the one for women in the dock defendants and see how the magistrates should be taking into consideration the needs and the rights of the child. Yeah. Um, the, 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 if I could just say quickly, the other research we've just done is on pregnant women in prison. And I'll put up a link to that. And I would encourage everybody listening to go to We Level Up and uh, sign the petition, which asks no more imprisonment of pregnant women, because you're punishing not only the women, but the unborn child. Thank you very much, Rona. Lovely to see you and some important um, tools and references and things. I can see lots of good stuff being shared um, in the in the chat. Actually, um, if we if we can go back to um, Kerry, um, if she's still there, I hope I hope she is. Yep, yep, I'm still Hi, here. Kerry. Sorry, thank you for for waiting. It's a great conversation. Um, we're obviously sitting here in the in the UK talking largely about our. Uh, 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 prison system, criminal justice system. In the States, you're in, you're in Texas, right? That's where, where you're based now, yeah. Um, in, in the States, a, a couple of questions really in one. Firstly, um, is the sort of, uh, I guess, m m mainstream societal op opinion of women in prison broadly similar to the one that we've just talked about here? So is it a sense that these women, they just need to be locked up, get them off the streets, cluttering the, you know, th is, is it a sort of a, is that the general feeling of what prison is for in the States? And secondly, do you have any sense, given what you said about bodily autonomy and the, uh, what we all know about Roe versus Wade is happening over there, do you have any sense of any desire politically with under the uh, Biden uh, um, administration to look at prison reform in the States at all? Or is it just not on the agenda at the moment? That is such an interesting question. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, when he ran, Biden definitely talked about prison reform in a few ways that haven't actually come to pass. And I mean, even one of what would be arguably, I think one of the most basic things he could have done was to, you know, get rid of the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Obviously, now that doesn't touch anything to do with our state prison systems like, you know, Texas, which is a mess. But the federal prison system 
came under has come under a lot of criticism in the past few years for you know repeated sex abuse scandals um a string of arrest of staff uh chronic understaffing terrible handling of the pandemic um there it's really just a clusterfuck and um you know one of the sort of things that i think everyone like the the staff unions you know advocates lawyers uh lawmakers i think anticipated would have been one of the first steps would have been to replace the head of the prison system and um you know that is not actually going to happen for another few weeks i mean as long as he's been in office like it's taken that long for this to happen so I think that the and there's other things too. I mean, he he could have taken more action to implement some of the specifics of one of the reform bills that passed under the prior administration, the First Step Act. Um, it did uh, a lot, and I know that seems surprising given you know uh, given what the prior administration was, but the First Step Act did do a lot to expedite release for certain prisoners and allow more treatment options, update the risk assessment tool that could be used to evaluate when someone should be released. Like there was a lot packed into that. And I think there was some expectation that he would take action to make sure that some of it was actually implemented more quickly than it was. And he didn't do those things. So, you know, it, he did eventually, but I mean, it just it not as quickly as anyone thought. So it does not seem like um, prison reform has been a huge priority for him. Although, I mean, he only controls the federal prison system, not the individual states. And what I think we can anticipate is that most of the prosecutions, well, all of the prosecutions of women who, you know, are asserting their bodily autonomy in ways that are, you know, determined to violate whatever laws, you know, come up in after the fall of Roe, all those prosecutions are going to happen at the state level. Um, so it's probably kind of not even his interest in reform is probably not even germane to that issue. Yeah, 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 it's a good point. Um, Kerry, slightly different uh, question. I'm conscious of time and I know there's people who want to say things in the room. But Kerry, your book, it really, because um, the way you've structured it, which is clever and very affecting that we, we, we journey side by side with the you before you go to prison and then the you in prison, the kind of the, the two, the two stories, if you like, run in parallel to one another. Um, when we're talking about how we need to rethink the whole system from the inside out and to look at mental health provision and community care, the whole thing, the beginning, middle and end, I'm really mindful of not being Pollyanna-ish and, and, and pretend, pretending that those things can happen overnight because they because they can't. But in your in your particular case, as an example, what would have made the biggest difference to you? Do you think in the you before your arrest and eventual incarceration? Because you were, you know, you were really struggling for you know it happened quite quickly when you call it. I think the unraveling or something is the word you use in the book in that period between the August and the Christmas, but what would have made the biggest difference as an intervention for you before you ended up in prison? I hate this question so much. <laughs> I get asked it so many times, but the thing is like, essentially um, to answer that, it's like, what is the sort of silver bullet for addiction? And I mean, I, it I don't- exist, right? Yeah, exactly. I don't have that. Like, there's a there's a lot of factors, and I do think that when people read my book, you can see there's certain points at which, like, you know, there might have been a different intervention, and and then there's also some things that are just not in there. I really didn't sort of unpack a lot about my um, relationship with my parents. Um, that was just not a central focus of the book. Um, you know, I I think I mean I think there's a lot of different things. You know both internal and external and in terms of, you know, how we treat mental health, how we stigmatize addiction, um, you know, how we treat young women in our society. Like, I think there's a lot that goes into that, but um, I, one of the, one of the problems I have with trying to answer that question of like, what is the one thing that would have made a difference is that um, I feel like so often people ask me that, and I don't think that's the context for, for you asking it, but in the context of being like, how can I avoid or how can my kid avoid, you know, doing those things? Like, what is the magic thing that I can do to avoid going down that path? And, um, you know, mental health is just too individualized to sort of offer that easy answer. So um, 
I always pivot and never really give an answer to that question because I don't, I don't, I can't solve addiction on this. I'm sorry. I'm not that good. Um, I th I'm sorry to ask the annoying question. Uh, it's, it's, she's a, uh, totally right, of course, but it is unsatisfying that there isn't a way to say, okay, look, we, we, there's, we find, we, uh, clearly there's a huge swathe of really complex, deep seated social issues that create this then there's the system here where there's been people you know for m many years and months good clever people saying this is how it should change this is how it could be better this is how we can treat people with more dignity and what have you and then there's all the stuff that happens afterwards but we know we know the reality is we're not going to close the women's prisons it's not going to happen so then my question is are we just left depending on people like you, people like you, people like Kerry, people like Amanda and other people watching tonight doing good work, but swimming against the tide. Like, is that just a defeatist attitude? Because that feels unsatisfying too. I think it's definitely possible to close the women's prisons. I think that that is an achievable goal. I think Go we on. have- tell us how. Pregnant women in prison, they should never be in prison. Even if they're very dangerous, okay, we'll keep them in secure units, not in a prison setting. That's not safe for pregnant women. So what's the difference between a secure unit and a prison? We, we can have, a, in, essentially, in the way that you think, nothing. Someone is locked in a space, yeah. um, but they have support with trained staff. Okay. Um, and it's not, they're not there for punishment. They're not locked behind their door. It's a collaborative relationship between them and the staff in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Anyone who is in for a non-violent crime can be released. So that's 70 to 80% of women can go out immediately. Yeah. Anyone who's on a short sentence because we've proven that they don't work, a community sentence does work. So that's 70 or 80% of people are in on a short sentence. They can be released immediately. Yeah. So I think we can, and I think we must continue to push. But also, I think we should decriminalise all drugs. I think the majority of people... Now you've lost the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See what happened? <laughs> I think the majority of people I know have taken drugs and have no problem whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I think for the people who it does become a problem for, if it's stigmatised and illegal, you will not seek help until you end up in prison. Yeah. Whereas if it's treated as a health issue, yeah. that it is, you will seek help, you will be given help, and then we don't need the petty thefts and we don't need the, the antisocial behaviour that comes with drugs. That's me done. Brenda. Now I'm putting you in charge. Sophie's had a go. She's not doing it for a day. Now you're in charge tomorrow. What's, wh where do you start? <sighs> to be honest, I, like my whole mission has been to prove that there's life after prison because I never thought I would get to prison or be in jail. I think meeting amazing women and knowing some of the things that they had already been through before their time, mm -hmm. I've realised that so many people kind of slip through those gaps and then they get to jail and it's like, oh, you was here like six months ago and you needed this help six months ago, right? We're back in the same thing. So I, I, do, I do agree with the simple fact that there is a lot of women that have in jail that shouldn't be in jail. Whether or not I believe in the system that we live in to be able to actually say, yes, let's let these women out is a, is a very different thing for me. But I think what I would like to see is just that every single woman, even just even men, like anyone that's going up in front of the judge has an actual fair trial. They actually are heard and we listen and understand what's going on. Like, like we obviously touched on the racism. Like I can commit a crime the same day as a white girl and she's gonna probably not go to jail. Like, but me, I can't change my skin colour in front of a judge. So automatically I have a, a little bit more aggression in myself. So there's all these things that go into the system that Unfortunately, they've been happening for years. And because people don't know, if I didn't talk about what I talk about today, people still wouldn't believe that I was nearly deported back to Africa. Do you understand? These are things that nobody talks about. People wouldn't understand that I had to go on hunger strike in order to prove my right to remain in this country, knowing that I was here since the age of three, four years old. Do you understand? These are things that no one understands. They don't ever get to see them. But if had I committed suicide in jail, this wouldn't be something that people talk about. Yeah. Do you understand? So I think for me, I just feel like, Everything needs to be like considered. I, I think, yeah, pe there is some, you know, if we talk about like people that have killed somebody or people that um, are paedophiles and that, there is, there is people that personally, I don't know, I personally wouldn't know how to rehabilitate those people, but I know how to deal with a young person that has stabbed somebody, bearing in mind that that person obviously has had debt since the age of 13 and then he goes on at 16 years old to kill somebody. I'm saying at the age of 13, when he had a debt of like 40 grand, why didn't somebody intervene mm -hmm. and make sure that that person was looked after? So for me, I feel like until we start to look at people as individual and really just 
kind of stop trying to just throw them into jail and hope for the best and then somehow believe that when they get out, I think it's going to be OK and they should be back into society. And don't worry, we've helped you public. We've kept you safe. Now he's out, she's out. What, it doesn't mean anything because really that person's sitting in jail yeah. with no support, no nothing. So I personally don't know if we can completely shut down prisons, to be honest, but I think if we are going to send people to jail, don't let them figure out what the word rehabilitation means on their own. Mm. Actually make it happen in the yeah. system. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a couple of things I want to um, throw in the mix. My colleague Hannah is sitting here. And Hannah is the producer on a, a podcast series that we're doing at the moment with Caroline Criado Perez. And the name of the podcast series is Visible Women Fixing the Something in a World Designed for Men, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically what she looks at is the gender data gap. So the world is designed for men, PP fits a man, cars are designed so that if it crashes, it saves a man, not a woman, all of that stuff. And a couple of times we've talked about how the prison system is designed for men. And I wonder if there's something there that Caroline and the team could look at specifically to do with the size of the space where, you know, Kerry talks really compellingly in her book about, you know, just things like where the window is in the cell that means that when someone walks past, they can see you on the loo. If you, all of that kind of stuff, there just might be something really interesting to look at from a sort of specific, from, like from a design the world point of view. There's a few things that... Um, have really hit home um, what Kerry said about if we were to design a humane prison, we wouldn't recognise it as a prison. And I think really that kind of captures what we're trying to get at here, which is you can redesign a prison till you're blue in the face. If it still looks like a prison, it's not going to work. And that, that's just kind of a, a thing to take away, but also a hard message to land if you're trying to build a sort of wider political and social consensus around something that people are terrified because what about the pedos, to your exact point at the beginning, Angela? Um, I think that um, uh, what Amanda said um, about the, the, the kind of kind of repeat, you know, lots and lots of offences, little ones, causing this kind of bouncing in and out and the perpetuation, the real long-term impact, not just on the woman concerned, but on her family, particularly on her children. That phrase that Amanda used, nobody should be in prison because they're a nuisance, is also something that really feels to me particularly gendered in this, in this conversation. Um, the idea that all sentences in some way are a life sentence, not just on the person, but on her family, is an idea that I think people can start to understand. It could be something that you could get people to kind of think through what that means for all of the subsequent life chances. Um, and the answer to me feels like, no, nobody <laughs> um, should be put in a prison. If I take Angela at her word that there are ways that you can design secure environments that keep everybody else safe for the people who really need it, bearing in mind that's one versus 10,000 others. That's a ratio that is useful and interesting to think about. Um, what these books do and what the stories we've heard tonight do, um, that's really changed my perspective genuinely from the beginning to prepare for this thinking and to the end of it now, is they, they make the person, the prisoner, be a person. There's a sort of humanising factor, give them a name, make them have a sense of humour, you know, paint in the gaps. So they're not just a person in a TV drama with the clank of the door, but a real human. Unfortunately, that takes empathy and it takes time and there's not a lot of room for that in modern politics. So I wish that we could do it and that Sophie could do it tomorrow. I don't think it's going to happen, but I think the work that you people are doing, and Kerry and Amanda too, and lots of people actually um, in the chat who we didn't have time to speak to, um, it's unbelievably valuable. And I hope we didn't even get to talk about Norway, which is amazing. That's a good news story. There's not a lot of them in prison world, but that's, that is one. Um, I, I really hope that we can reconvene maybe in three years and have a different context to the conversation and feel that there is a bit more hope than perhaps there is now. But thank you very much to Angela um, and to Kerry in Texas and to Brenda here in the newsroom and to Amanda in Hull. I mean, it's everybody all over the place. Um, and to you who've all been here, thank you very much. I've been Liz. Take care. <laughs>